Are we seeing more bodybuilders now use GLP-1 agonists to- Yes. Yeah, I was about to say, right? Like, why wouldn't you? It would make, yes. it would make the most difficult part of bodybuilding easier, which is the calorie restriction, right? You said that in a way I cannot say any better. There are three groups of people in bodybuilding today. People that have emphatically adopted the use of GLP-1s. Group two are people that either use or don't use, but don't say much about them, either don't care, don't know, or they're using, but they're kind of shush about it. And then there's another group that is just absolutely viciously opposed to them for reasons that are almost always wildly irrational, but moralistically understandable. Just to be clear, there is a category of bodybuilder who fully endorse the liberal use of anabolic steroids but oppose the use of GLP-1 agonists? Vehemently. And the moral argument is? You have to suffer through the hunger to earn your right to call yourself a competitive bodybuilder. What do you think about that? Um, I could probably steal mana. Yeah, I mean, look, I, I think having never done bodybuilding, I'm probably not a good person to, 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 to sort of offer a point of view on that. Um, Obviously, it you you could argue that um, if the if the if the stripes are earned through that type of suffering, um, or let's take a step back. If the stripes are earned through suffering, there's two types of suffering. There's the suffering you do in the gym, the pain of the gym, and then there's the pain of the 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 second one, the starving, the Lifestyle. the calorie restriction. Mm. And if they're saying you have to have both of those to be one of us, then steroids are not a problem. In fact, they allow you to suffer more potentially. They allow you to push yourself much Definitely harder. Definitely true. So, so maybe in that sense, steroids are an important part of bodybuilding if the suffering is the, is the card and the GLP-1 agonist is, is not. So, so maybe that's the argument. I, again, I, I, I probably wouldn't have come to that argument. I probably would have said, well, if we're in the business of using any form of pharmacology to enhance our physiques, we should take whatever we can get, provided it's safe. Yes. Uh, I'm in that camp as well. There are at least two things those folks aren't considering. Thing number one is that if you can achieve a certain level of body fat with a caloric restriction, without GLP-1s, when you use any given dose of GLP-1s to reduce your hunger, you get two things out of that. One is now you can push to even more exotically lean levels, which you should be. We're not trying to race to the same point. The destination changes. So you can get some faint glute striations and win a few shows without GLPs. Maybe you can get completely stripped out of your mind with them. It's just as hard. You're just as hungry, but just as hungry a 3% body fat is a very different look than just as hungry at 6%. One is GLP enhanced, one is not. That's a big deal to remember. The other thing is you have to deal with side effects of GLPs. I mean, like they give you heartburn. There is a certain amount of food focus they don't eliminate, like watching TV shows and watching people on them eat tasty foods when you're in prep is not as difficult because you're not physiologically as hungry but you still have cravings and your cravings are lower, but they're still there. And you still dream about food and the whole gamut. It's not the, it's not complete kiboshing of hunger. Now, I hope one day very soon we'll achieve that. And that'll be a, a miraculous thing. It'll save, I don't know, hundreds of millions of people from the obesity epidemic, a little, little like footnote in, in history, but that'll be cool. And then your job will be like, if you want, if you have more bandwidth, because shit is easier, just push your conditioning further, get even leaner. That's a, that's a big deal that people seem to forget. The other deal is there is a preposterous amount of assuming that work and diligence are the big variables that separate bodybuilders. Usually that assumption is made by people with elite genetics and it's just not true. Uh, my jujitsu coach, a gentleman named Mr. Will Starks, phenomenal professional MMA athlete. Will eats a very clean diet, very, very healthy diet, but he has, you know, tons of freebies, potato chips, pizza here and there, no big deal. He trains for mixed martial arts. He's a pro. He has glute striations. He walks around and lives his life at 7% body fat. That's just how he exists in the world. It would take him one cycle of training to turn pro. He's drug free. 
if you look at him in the gym and if he put on some posing trunks and you looked at his glutes, you ask some people in the gym, what's that all about? They'd be like, man, it must take a lot of hard work. Bullshit. Took no, no work at all. Now, he trains his ass off in MMA, but how many MMA guys do you see with striated glutes? It's almost not a thing. So you would look at that and be like, it took, a, 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 let's say he diets for six weeks and actually starts resistance training for hypertrophy for the first time in his life, I might add, in his mid thirties. This is our plan for Will once he's ready. He's going to, he's going to turn drug-free pro his first or second show, no problem. And people are going to go, man, it must've taken a lot of work. And he'd be like, ha ah, well, actually not really. And so if you have someone on stage against him who takes second place, but they started their diet at 20% body fat and their diet took 18 weeks. Who worked harder? People would tell you the guy with striated glutes did and they would be fucking wrong, wrong, wrong. So when you look at people using GLPs, you assume everyone has kind of decent genetics. That's not true. And people who have been fatter before have a much harder time getting leaner for a bunch of different reasons. They're dealing with the same genetics that got them fat and they have excess fat cells that scream uh, hunger signaling into the ether all the time. So the idea that bodybuilding is about earning your keep and grinding and suffering is true, but we already use enhancement in so many different ways. Why not use enhancement in this other way? I never gotten a clear answer on that because most of the people that espouse such opinions don't have the patience or intellectual capacity to deal with such issues. So it's just something you scroll by on Instagram and go note it, scrolling on to the next thing or turning my phone off and flushing it down the toilet. So Mike, what do you think that tells us about kind of the, the, the morality of, of GLP-1 use much more commonly? Because obviously the majority of people using GLP-1 agonists and dual agonists, et cetera, um, are, are not bodybuilders and are professional people whose livelihoods depends on their physique. It's normal people. Again, let's also take out the category of people with type 2 diabetes or with such significant obesity that, um, you know, it's impacting, you know, their health in ways that are direct and measurable through the excess adiposity. Let's talk about what is probably the majority of, of people who um, would use a GLP-1 agonist right now, which are are people who might actually even be healthy. They might be overweight, yeah. but but still be perfectly healthy. I'm healthy GLP ones right now. Yeah. And so, so tell me, why do you think that there is a bit of a moral panic about this? Yeah. Most of the people that are morally panicking will tell you why. Most of what they say is that you have to earn your fitness. And if you are lazy and you just take a pill and you lose all the weight, you haven't addressed the root cause of the issue, which is your poor diet. And there's something to say there, but um, I don't understand much further about their own logic. I would say they're not thinking a lot. They're just having a lot of feelings. Like if you talk to most people about politics, you'll realize that most people are not geopolitical strategists or econometricians. They just feel a lot. And so this is one of these things where people have a lot of feelings, but if they pulled it back and actually logic through it, they would conclude that like, oh, these modern anorectic drugs are tools to accomplish something. And whatever tools you use that make sense for you should be a valid consideration for the goal. But a lot of people use physical fitness, especially external, as a proxy for conscientiousness, the ability to organize your life, to delay gratification, so on and so forth. And the reality is that probably the two biggest predictors of how obese someone is are your genetic hunger drive and your degree of conscientiousness. So the only thing that the GLPs eliminate as a category of problem is the hunger drive. They eliminate it, but they do a great job, reduce it substantially. So now we're left with people that are leaner, some of whom just have average conscientiousness, but now low food drive, and now they're leaner. And this especially upsets people that have lost weight themselves on their own, and they took a certain moral worthiness, a certain gold star on their, on their chest for it. Say, I was conscientious and willful enough to do this. 
And to those people, they're absolutely correct. Like what they did was monumental and ultra impressive. And they feel sort of ripped off because other people are now doing it by just like taking a weekly injection. But that belief in yourself, that flexing of your conscientious muscle that you did, it's your benefit for yourself to keep. And the other way to think about it is if you just, if you had to lose 20 pounds and really focus yourself to do it and to keep the weight off, you're focused all the time. What you could do is take an anorectic drug, GLP-1, for example, and now you don't have to try as hard to limit yourself because your food, your natural, your appetite is like normal. And you can take all of that bandwidth of willpower and effort and conscientiousness and apply it to something else business, family life. If you have to diet hard enough to lose a bunch of weight, your bandwidth for your work, your bandwidth for family, your bandwidth for enjoying your life have to go down. Otherwise, you're just not dieting hard enough. And if you now have a solution to the hard dieting problem in which you can actually do a much better job with less input, that doesn't mean you're on the couch eating Cheetos, though it could if you choose. What it means is now you have more bandwidth that opens up for all of these other wonderful things in which you can express your conscientiousness, build your business better, spend more time with your family. So has that been your experience, which is it hasn't actually changed what you're eating. It's just given you the, the privilege of focusing less on the starvation and the management of diet. That's exactly been my experience. My wife um, was either genetically or epigenetically geared to just get fat. Uh, at one point she was almost 200 pounds at four foot 11. And she probably has more willpower than I've ever seen in a single human being. She'll break herself before she quits at stuff. And her hunger signaling was so profound that she battled it her whole life, had lots of victories, lots of defeats. And her introduction to, to GLPs, to Ozempic, was the kind of thing that borders on the religious experience for the first time ever to be like, oh, this is how normal people live their lives. And now she's whatever body weight she wants to be and lives at a category level of body fat, uh, or sorry, category level of life experience she was unable to access before because especially if females of reproductive age, having 70 pounds extra adiposity, how the world sees you, how you see yourself is, is totally different. She almost failed out of medical school because she was dieting so hard to try to stay at a certain body fat that her brain just wasn't working. And it's easy for bodybuilders and other folks to say, like, well, you just got to gut through it. Like, guy, you don't do anything except shoot steroids, play PlayStation, and train with weights. Thank God for your supplement contract. <laughs> there was somebody on social media that she sort of opened up about her journey. And this, like, bodybuilder is not even competitive. He's just a guy who lifts weights. He's a personal trainer. He he, he said something like, like, you basically you failed at life if you needed the Ozempic. And like, my friend, if we start listing off my wife's like accomplishments, it's going to be a 10 to zero against you. Like you're nothing to her. She had every bit more willpower, whatever it is you got good at, she could recreationally get good at faster than you, better than you just as a joke and then quit and then come back and do it again. But because you have no idea what it's like to want food that much, you're out of touch. I would say it is, uh, for me became very easy to connect with my wife on food drive after I had to it down to body fat that was uh, competitive bodybuilding appropriate enough times. You feel what it's like to be obsessed. All you're thinking with food. about is food. All you're thinking about food tastes good to a level if you're like, am I eating drugs? Like, what the hell is going on? And you're in pain physically from the expansion of your abdominal tract, and you're still eating. And your eyes are this wide, like a hungry, ravenous dog who, like, is tortured and not allowed to eat for a long time. That's how a lot of people live in the world. And again, there's two variables that come into determining how fat you are primarily. One is food noise. One is conscientiousness. So if we just end the food noise, some people will still be overweight, even if they're on Ozempic, because they're like, ah, whatever, just Reese's Cups. Enough Reese's Cups can defeat any amount of pharmacology so far. For those people, all those discussions about like, hey, like you should be more diligent, you should be planning. Yeah, they're all still valid. But if we can just remove one impediment, amazing. People come at this from a morality that you have to earn your keep. Now, in sport competition, yeah, hell yeah, it's cheating. Now, in bodybuilding competition, they don't test for drugs at all. It's not cheating at all. But people take this 
this morality, this cheating stuff, and they put it out in the real world. But do you think it should be, I've talked about this before, uh, in cycling, a sport where they're very clear on what the rules are, no performance enhancing drugs. But to date, all of the performance enhancement has been on the generation of power, right? EPO, testosterone, things like that. But anybody who's ever ridden a bike knows it's half power, half weight. Cyclists spend a lot of time being hungry. Many of them do. Some of them don't. Uh, you also, your total calorie expenditure throughout the week is so preposterous. Sometimes you, cyclists have trouble keeping up their weight. So you see all the whole range. But if there is a drug that solves a very big problem for you that makes you better and you're purporting to be a drug-free federation, yes, you should be testing for it and it should be a banned substance. Uh -huh.